bless the Lord. Amen. Brother Eli, would you collect the Sunday school offering? Have it, he can have it, and 
she can have it, but the rest of you, you know, good luck, you're going to have to strive in life. But he said, it's for everyone who believes. It's for all of them. And right then and there, they receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost with evidence of speaking in other tongues. To so get the gifts of the Spirit, first you have to have the baptism of the Holy Ghost with evidence of other tongues. But then, Scripture is clear that the Holy Ghost gives to everyone that has the baptism of the Holy Ghost several gifts as he will. When we look at these gifts, they're not fleshly gifts. They're not earthly gifts. Just like the weapons of our warfare. They're not fleshly. They're not carnal. When we talk about the sword of the Spirit, we're not talking about a literal sword that you can keep in your sheath or anything like that. But it's the Word of God. Both written, but also unwritten. It's the living Word of God as well. Sandals of peace. It's not a physical pair of sandals that they have on the side instead of Nike, but it's peace. But they're spiritual armor. The weapon, the gifts are the same way. They're not cardinal gifts, but they're spiritual gifts. They and what are these gifts used for? Can anyone tell me what why do we have the gifts of the spirit? Why is it, why is it even important to have them? What's that? Edification. But edification of who? Edification of the church. For the sake of... Let's go ahead and read. If someone please read Ephesians chapter 4, 11 through 13. Ephesians 4, 11 through 13. Personal 
use of the gifts is corruption of the gifts. And that is a possibility as well. We're going to talk about that. I don't want to spend all our time on review, but it is important that we review in general the gifts before we start talking about them in, as in a smaller spectrum. But if we want to get in detail, you know, we could talk about it being for the persuasion of believer. We find that in 1 Corinthians 14, 24. Uh, let's go ahead and just read that one since uh, this morning. 1 Corinthians 14, 24. So when we look at here, Paul's talking about the gift being used for the persuasion of the unbeliever. I mean, if we went down through the list, we could create our own list, which is what I did here. The validation of the gospel message. You know, there are going to be times when people might come against you and say, well, that's not right. That's not right. Even in the public eye. I mean, it's, been, it's happened overseas and foreign, or foreign mission fields. And God has shown signs and wonders to prove that his was the true gospel. To guide and direct the believer, point praise to God, comfort of the saints. You know, there are many reasons we have the gift, but if we come down to a nutshell, I still think it's for the perfecting of the saints, the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, because in a nutshell, that's why they were given. And we are not to be competing with one another when it comes to the gifts of the Spirit or trying to override each other. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, I, I lied, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 31. The Bible states, Paul writing, but covet, covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. Remember when we look at the passage concerning the gifts of the Spirit that concerns 1 Corinthians 12 all the way through 14? We'd love to talk about chapter 13 being the love chapter. But Paul is dealing with an issue because when we go back in time to the time of Jesus, were there chapters, were there verses in the Bible? Yay, nay. Do you remember? No, brother, just in the chapters and the verses were not there. It was just written like one long letter. So when we get during the time of Christ, and we look at the Apostle Paul writing, he did not have in his epistle chapter 13, verse 1, chapter 13, verse 2. Rather, a month later on added those to break it up for us. Did he take away from the Word of God? No, he made it a little bit easier for us, but... When it comes to one chapter sometimes seeming like it leads into another chapter or halfway through another chapter, that's why. But when we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 14, those chapters were not there. Those divisions were not there. So when Paul's writing his letter, he's just writing. So he's telling them, but covet earnestly the best gift, yet I show you another way. And he just keeps writing. When we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 through 14, He's dealing with an issue here. There were people in the church contending with each other when it comes to the gifts of the Spirit. How are they contending? I honestly, personally do not know. I was not there. I know I look old, but I was not there. But whether they were contending that, oh, so-and-so got this gift, now I need to get that gift, or whether somebody had the gift of prophecy, and they knew that maybe Brother Eli had the gift of tongues, and Brother Dennis had the gift of interpretation. Well, then I have to get my prophecy out before they get there, because I want to be the one to use, and not them. How are they competing? I do not know. But Paul goes on to show them that it doesn't matter how many times you're using the gifts of the, gifts of the Spirit, if you do not do it for love, or let's just paraphrasing, if you don't use it either for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, or for the edifying of the body of Christ, if you're doing it to edify you, it's of no avail. You're no better than a sounding brass, tinkling cymbal, car alarm going off in the middle of the night. There's no point to it. 
You're not gaining anything. You're not glorifying God. But rather, these gifts are to be used in love. That you may grow. That your brothers and sister may grow. That the church may grow. That the unbeliever may come to know Christ. That is the point of the gifts of the Spirit. And now I'm going to quickly move on because I do want to get to our lesson. But the other thing, too, that I do want to mention real quickly is sometimes people can misuse gifts. They really can. And it might not be of God at all. Maybe me and Brother Eli are having a quarrel. And Brother Eli gets up and he prophesies that God's going to strike me down. He's going to run over my dog and burn down my house. Do I come right out and say to Brother Eli in the middle of everybody, that is false. When ever, if a brother or a sister is coming against you and they are actually using the gifts of the Spirit, we need to be careful even from our end, especially if we are the one being attacked. Because what if that was God? God can use whoever he wants. He's used a donkey. And maybe that truly was the message of God. Maybe when I got home today, there was going to be a dog on my front porch. Do not pray that prayer because I do not want a dog on my front porch. <laughs> Sister Beth wants the dog. I do not. And for all I know, when I get home, there's going to be a dog on my front porch, Brother Dennis. And all of a sudden, for all I know, the dog's going to run out in the traffic and get to it after I tell Sister Beth that she can keep it. I will be rejoicing on the porch. Sister Beth will be in tears. Dog will be dead. And all of a sudden, lightning strikes and burns down my house at the same time. And for some reason, I get sick and I fall down on the ground. Brother Eli's prophecy could have been general. Even though he had a quarrel against me. The other thing, too, is, like I said, unless you know it's not God, we need to be careful. Because if it is truly the Word of God, that is God speaking. And what happens when we attribute something that is of God to something else? But what does the Bible say? Because if we don't attribute it to you, we attribute it to the devil working against us. Well, now we're attributing that message to being the work of the enemy and the devil's doing. And what does the Bible talk about being the one unforgivable sin? Blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. What is blasphemy of the Holy Ghost? Attributing the works of God to those of the devil. We need to be extremely careful if we do make those judgment calls. Amen. The other thing, too, as a Christian believer... Guess who's to fight our battles? If Brother Eli is coming against me, is it my place to go against him? No. Because really, Brother Eli, if you're coming against me, you're coming against me. I'm using Brother Eli because I'm comfortable enough with Brother Eli, and I know he's not going to come against me, and he knows I'm joking, I'm just making a point. But the other thing, too, is we have to be careful. Thank you, brother, because I was stalling because I forgot what I was talking about. <laughs> but the other thing I thought I was going to say is, if Brother Eli is coming against me or anybody else, as long as I'm living right, I know what I'm supposed to be doing, that I'm doing it, he's not just attacking me, but he's attacking God. Exactly. Absolutely. And if I retaliate, it's not my place to give judgment. I want to be careful with that because too many people are crying, do not judge, do not judge, and that's not the full word of God. And it says to mark those that cause division and so forth and so forth. But, but at the same time, if you're coming against me, you're coming against God. I'm much better off letting God take care of it because he knows the perfect way to take care of it and everything else. Oh, and he'll resolve it. The other thing, too, is Brother Eli could get up he could try to prophesy against me. He's mad at me for some reason. But you know that 
instead of prophesying cursing, he could end up prophesying blessing upon me. We see that in the Word of God. Balaam was a false prophet. But you know, every time he tried to get up and curse Israel, God made it. And he was prophesying the Word of God, even though he was a false prophet. Every time he got up and prophesied against Israel, though, the words of God came out and it was blessing instead of cursing. Yeah. But the point is, the gifts of the Spirit are not for our personal use. They are for the edification of the saints, for the edifying, of the, for the perfecting of the saints, edifying of the body, and the work of the ministry. But we need to be careful when we do make those judgment calls. Because if we do judge a brother or a sister that that is a false message, we need to make sure that we know, that we know, that we know that it is not of God. Because if we're not sure, it's better for us just to keep our mouth shut and let God take care of it. Okay, moving on to today, we're going to talk about the word of wisdom a little bit. If someone would please read 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7. The manifestation is given to every man to profit with all. Now at this point, the scripture is assuming, and we've already established in scripture at this point, that when it says to every man to profit with all, it's referring to everyone that has the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Because now it's going to start getting into the gifts of the Spirit and listing them. When we look at the gifts of the Spirit, we've talked about there being three different types of classifications. What do I mean by that? We have the revelation gifts, the power gifts, and the inspiration of the gifts. That's all page 41 of your notes. When we look at the word of wisdom, it falls under the revelation gifts. When we look at wisdom, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7 has great insight. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7. And the Bible reads, Wisdom is the principal thing Therefore get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. So wisdom is the principal thing. Now when we're looking here at the book of Proverbs, it's not talking about the gift of wisdom, but it's talking about wisdom in general. And it is referring to spiritual wisdom. Because there are three types of wisdom. If someone would please read, find Ecclesiastes 1. Chapter 16 through 18. Ah, Ecclesiastes 1, verses 16 through 18. Ecclesiastes 1, 16 through 18. Someone else, 1 Corinthians, chapter 2, verse 6. And you might as well just hold that and then read verse 7 after that as well. So 1 Corinthians, chapter 2, 6 and 7. And then Ecclesiastes 1, 16 through 18. Does anyone have Ecclesiastes Chapter 1, 16 through 18. I'll go ahead and read Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 16 through 18. I communed with my own heart, saying, Lo, I am come to great estate, and have gotten more wisdom than all they that have been before me in Jerusalem. Yea, my heart had great experience of wisdom and knowledge, and I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this is also, this also is vexation of spirit, for in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increases knowledge, knowledge increases sorrow. So when we're looking here, we're looking at the wisdom of man. So there's the wisdom of man. What does 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 6 say? Of we speak wisdom, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught. So according to verse 6, there is worldly wisdom. So there is the, the wisdom of man, 
there's the wisdom of the world. But what does chapter, uh, verse 7 state there, Mom? But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. And then there's the wisdom of God. So there's the wisdom of man, the wisdom of this world, and the wisdom of God. When we study out the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of man, the Bible states that they are foolishness. They are folly. We just read in Ecclesiastes chapter 16, oh, chapter 1. Um, let me just read it real quick. They are mad. The wisdom of this of man is madness and folly. And the knowledge of man bringeth much sorrow. It increaseth sorrow. So there are three types of wisdom. So what kind of wisdom does the Bible want us to get? It wants us to get the wisdom of God. We need to acquire the wisdom of God. Paul made a distinction in uh, First Corinthians. Do you still have a First Corinthians chapter two, Mark? You want to go ahead and read verse four while you're there, please. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. So Paul made a distinction even here in First Corinthians chapter two between the distinction. Distincting, oh, I'm getting my words off on so well. But he made a distinction between the wisdom of man and the wisdom of God. And he said, I didn't come to you with enticing words and man's wisdom, but I came with the wisdom of God. If you remember the main verse we used last week when studying the death of Christ through a scientific means, Paul referred to science in the book of Timothy as, or the science of man, as science falsely so called. So man thinks that his wisdom is high, but his folly, his foolishness, is not wisdom at all. It may make us wise in our other man's own eyes, but when you get down right to it, it's folly, it's foolishness, it's madness, because we're relying upon the flesh, and we're not relying upon God. When we get down to wisdom, wisdom is the mind of God. And what does the Bible state concerning God's thoughts and our thoughts? What's that? Foolishness. Oh, well, when we look at the verse... Oh. God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Exactly. Yeah, voices. But what I'm getting at, when we try to use man's wisdom instead of God's wisdom, God's wisdom is much more higher. His ways are not our ways. Bible states that his thoughts are not our thoughts. So we need to seek after godly wisdom. And Paul made that distinction. He said, I didn't come telling you what I thought was right or in my own understanding. I came in the wisdom of God, making that distinction. Because when we have the wisdom of God, then we can rightly apply the word of God and at that point, our blade is so sharp that we can make that distinction, not because it's us, but it's the Holy Ghost guiding and directing us. He is the one giving us the wisdom. So how do we acquire wisdom? I mean, after all, we are instructed to get it. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 7, we've already read that. What is wisdom? What kind of thing is wisdom? Principle. When we talk about the word principle a little bit, it would mean chiefly, most important. Wisdom is the most important thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And with wisdom, get understanding. If we look at that word principle, even the way it's used in the Bible here in Proverbs chapter 4, we go back to Strong's Hebrews Dictionary, it means this. The first place, the first in place, time, order, or rank. Beginning, chief. So when we look at it, it means exactly what we think it does. Even if we study now in the English vernacular, it means it is the most important thing. It's not number two. It's not number three. It is number one. Of everything in this world, get godly wisdom. So if we are to get godly wisdom, how do we do that? How do we go about it? How do you think that we begin achieving or acquiring godly wisdom? Through 
prayer and fasting, reading the Word of God. But there's one big thing that is going to come back to us, as much as we need to do those things. It comes back to our motive and our intent. Because we can pray every day because we're supposed to. We can read our Bible every day because we're supposed to. And we can do our devotions and just get through it. But we need to pray. We need to read our Bible with the intent that we are seeking God. Because the more that we seek after God, that's when everything's going to change. We can do things habitually. We can do things because we're supposed to. But it's in those moments when our heart is in its right place that we are seeking God with everything that we can. That's when everything changes. Because, yes, we can get wisdom through, from reading the Word of God. But if we are going to achieve wisdom and knowledge, because these two go hand in hand, wisdom and knowledge go hand in hand, then we need to do it with an intent that we are seeking or chasing after God. Just to make the distinction before I forget, knowledge is information. You can know to do something, but wisdom is the application part. Wisdom is the part where we take that knowledge and now we know what to do with it. So wisdom and knowledge do go hand in hand. They're information. But even but when we get down to it, how do we get wisdom? We've already said that, but what is wisdom? What does Job chapter 28 and 28 state? Job 28, 28. So what did Job say is wisdom? It is the fear of the Lord. Now it's not a fear where you sit down and you shudder and your ankles are going back and forth because you're afraid that God's going to strike you down. It's a fear where we reverence God. We respect Him. We are seeking after Him with our whole heart that we may know Him. Not out of fear like a slave would with a master that's about to beat him. But we're seeking after God with a heart that we may know Him in purity. Psalm 111 and verse 10 states this. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding of all they that do His commandments, His praise endureth forever. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of of wisdom. And there are other verses you can dive into if you want to study out a little bit farther. But when we look at the word of wisdom, now like I said, going back a little bit, anyone can achieve God of wisdom. We get that through studying the word of God by seeking to know him. But there is such a thing as the gift of wisdom. The word of wisdom, or the gift of wisdom, is a supernatural gift that comes from whom? The Holy Ghost to those that have the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of other tongues. It is not natural wisdom. What does 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 19 states concerning man's wisdom? First Corinthians chapter three and verse nineteen. The wisdom of this world is foolishness of God, for it is written he takes the wise in their own craftiness. The man's wisdom, or the wisdom of this world, is foolishness to God. If we went back, knowing what we know now, during the time of Christopher Columbus, before he set sail, and we were standing in the room with the queen or whoever else was there, or we were in the scientific studies of the men of that time, and if we, let's just say for sake of argument, that they had a globe like we had today, like a, a dimension of the earth, what would their, their globe look like? A flat pancake. 
because the earth was flat and everybody knew that in 1492, right? But is the earth really flat? And if somebody from today went back then and heard them talk about how the earth was flat and you're going to fall off to the tip of the earth, brother uh, Christopher Columbus, we'd, they'd probably be laughing at them. Why? Because man's foolishness is folly. It's the wisdom of God we have to see. Because even when we get down to the wisdom of God, and I'm going to forget where it's at, I think it's the book of Isaiah, it talks about the sphere of the earth. So even before Christopher Columbus time, the word of God informed them that the earth was round. It's not flat. But man's wisdom said that the earth is flat and that there's an edge. Man's wisdom is foolishness. This is also illustrated with the parable of the man who built his house upon the rock and the man who built his house upon the sand. You know, the man who built his house upon the sand, that was foolishness. But that's representative, representative or representation of man's knowledge. Man can build his house upon the sand, and it can look exactly like the man who built his house upon the rock, but the problem is they have two different foundations. One solid and one can be washed away. The man's foundation, the sand, that's man's wisdom. It gets washed away. And his house that's pop, stand, that is built upon it cannot stand. Why? Because it was built upon man's wisdom, man's foolishness. But the man who built his house upon the rock, that was godly wisdom. And his foundation cannot be removed from underneath. The winds can come, the rains can pour, the floods can come. But the man who built his wisdom upon godly wisdom, or let me take that back. The man whose wisdom is godly wisdom and not man's wisdom, his wisdom again is going to remain because it's not man's wisdom. It only comes from one source, and that is God himself. When we look at the gift of wisdom, it gives us understanding in either natural things or spiritual things. It doesn't. The gift itself comes from God. The wisdom is God's wisdom. But God gives us wisdom for earthly things as well as spiritual things. And this wisdom is instruction and knowledge, not just in a situation, but how to resolve a situation. God can tell mom that man, so and so over there, they're having marriage problems and yada yada yada, or they're having problems disciplining, uh, keeping their kids in check. And, they can, and God can tell her that. What is that? That is knowledge. But him telling her how to help them and guide them to correct it, that would be the gift of wisdom. The gift of wisdom is knowledge, but it's knowledge not just about a particular something or area, but it's something how to resolve it, how to apply it. It is application. And the Holy Ghost can give you the answer for spiritual situations. He can give you the answer for counseling. Or he can even give you instruction or natural things as well. How many of us have misplaced things before? How many of us have lost our keys? How many have lost our glasses? How many, and they were right on our forehead. How many of us have lost a pen or pencil when we were working on things? I know when Pat helps me out. We normally end up with, what, five different pencils, three different pencils? One at one ended up staying at the workstation, one ends up upstairs, one ends up downstairs. Why? Because we lose it, we forget it upstairs, and we're not going back. But we lose things. The Holy Ghost, the gift of wisdom, can be used also to help us find things. Brother Eli's praying, God, where did I leave my wallet at? And the Holy Ghost can come by. Now, he knows he needs to find his wallet. He knows how to find a wallet. He just doesn't know where it's at. And the Holy Ghost comes by, drops it in his spirit, and God tells him, Brother Eli, your wallet's under the bed because Fossey took it and ran off with it. That would be an example of godly wisdom. Does anybody have any thoughts, any questions, anything they want to add at this point? So knowledge is information concerning something. 
And wisdom is knowing how to apply it. And when we look at the gift of wisdom, it is God instructing those that have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and not that he can't talk to those who do not have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, but the gift of wisdom is for those that do have it. And that gift is only from God himself. It is not earthly, it is not carnal, but it comes from the mind of God himself. Let us bow our heads and prepare our hearts for service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and shall continue to do. Lord, we thank you that you're God who reigns on high and there is none like you, Lord. We rebuke every attack of the enemy right now in the name of Jesus that may come our way. We pray that you set your angels at the four corners of the property above and below, that no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts will be in one mindset and one accord, that we may worship you in sincerity and truth, that the Holy Ghost may move as he so desires, Lord. May we not hinder him in any way or grieve the Holy Ghost, Lord. But Lord, may our minds and hearts be proud that they be good soil for your word to fall, Lord, that we may remember it throughout the week, but even greater than that, that we may apply it to our lives, that we may be in one mindset and one accord, that you would receive all the honor and praise that is due you, Lord. Anoint the song leader and the musicians as they lead us to the songs you'd have us to sing. As they praise you upon the string instruments and the vocal cords, Lord, give them up a special blessing. Anoint the pastor's mind and his lips to bring forth your word, Lord, today. I pray, Lord, that you give him a special blessing as well. Let all that is said and done be as Jesus prayed in John chapter 17, that the Father be magnified and glorified. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. No, 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 no. No, because she drove separate too. I don't need to come home to that. <laughs>